plant signaling is kind of one of the big unknowns. We know a lot about how plants respond to various different things. These are one of some of the easier things to learn about. Um, it's more visual, and people have documented those over the years. Um, we also know at least quite a bit about the stimulus, the stimuli themselves, you know, the various different environmental stimuli or other stimuli that uh, plants might respond to. But connecting those two things, trying to figure out how a biophysical or a temperature or light or whatever the environmental stimulus is connects to that bio biochemical response. Um, there's still a huge amount of no knowledge that we just don't have. We don't know what it is. We don't know how it works. You know, some of these fields um, have had a lot more advances than others. Um, and a lot of that goes into how many people are working on it or some major discovery that kind of broke open a specific field. But signaling in and of itself is, um, one, there's a lot we don't know about it, so it's a really open field. And two, it's something that just personally interests me, how you get um, one mechanism to another, how, how information is communicated, and that's particularly interesting. And that's what we're looking at, how that works. Trying to put the pieces of the mechanisms together, um, especially for the gravitropic signaling, over the time that I've been in this field, we've identified numerous components, but we don't know how the components fit together. So trying to figure out kind of that big picture, you know, how does this work? You know, there's got to be a flow to the molecules. Now, not all these molecules are going to be in a linear flow. So, you know, that complicates the issue that there might be um, multiple different mechanisms to get through. Um, so those types of things, you know, when I'm lying awake thinking about what we're doing in the lab or what the next big grant proposal is going to be, those are the types of things I'm trying to figure out. How do we get a more connected signaling pathway? How do we break through and actually get beyond just kind of these individual components? We don't know that we have all the individual components, so we still need some work in that area, but until we have some at least partially laid out pathway, it's going to be hard to know if we have all the components or not. And clearly we don't because we can't figure out the pathway. So um, those are the types of things that I think about. And then the other thing that I think about is how to find those pieces and parts. How do we... In, what's the ultimate experiment? What's the experiment that will show that these things are linked? What's the experiment that will give us that linkage and, and let us move forward? Balance is always a problem. Um, I'm not sure how I balance it. I know that when my focus is on one thing, it's 110% on that one thing. And probably what I do is not balance as much as I compartmentalize. You know, this is the day I'm going to spend on this. This is when I need to get that done. You know, so I'm um, very good at saying, all right, here it is. And once I get on a project, I'm absolutely dedicated to that project. I am so task-oriented. It's like I'm going to get this finished. Um, so it takes up most of my mental power at the time and most of my abilities. So I just kind of work straight through that, and then I say, okay, that's done, and now I can pick up the next thing. And I think in the back of my mind, a lot of these things are just running around, working on their own, working on themselves, while I'm focused on the one thing that I'm working on right now. That's all I do. I just go from deadline to deadline to deadline. <laughs> It's really funny for me working here because I always keep my office door open. So having the the, the narrow of tension to one thing that's on my computer screen is rare because people are coming in and out and coming in and out. So I actually get a lot done on the weekends and when, when there's no one else around, mm -hmm. early in the morning. 
Mm. I come in early, and the reason that I come in early is because it's quiet time, and I can, I know nobody else is going to be here. It's very rare for somebody to be here, so I'm not interrupted. Mm-hmm. Now, the bad part about that is I wind up staying late because other people are ready to work at that point. I think those synergies actually come about many times more in teaching than they do in research, although I think it opens up my mind to think about research in a different way. Uh, maybe. Um, it, it doesn't... It doesn't kind of limit me to kind of a mechanistic view of plants. Um, But I think in my teaching, having those references, having that broader background um, actually gives me an advantage. I think that's one of the big advantages in my teaching is that I can relate better to a wider variety of students And I can pull the sciences more to that broad range of students and to the general public because I have a better idea of kind of what they might know that I can connect with. Um, So I think that's really, you know, the idea of the science cafes and those kinds of things. Those are places, I think, where um, you see the, the broader piece and in the writing. So I'm not as mechanistic as some of the other people or some of the scientists that I know. But actually, there are quite a few scientists that are mm-hmm. got a foot in the humanities, if you will. Um, for space travel, space colonization, I mean, what NASA is really looking for from plants is bioregenerative life support. Um, that's what's going on on Earth. There's a huge synergy between plants and animals. And we can't go into space or, you know, colonize other planets or whatever without plants. It cannot be done. You can't ship enough food. You can't launch it off this Earth. Food, oxygen, water, you know, shelter, everything you're going to need and actually expect to be able to lift it off. I mean, just the, it's physically impossible. It's financially impossible, but it's kind of physically impossible to keep launching everything that you would need, um, especially for a long-term space flight where you don't, you're even prohibited by time. So to be able to grow plants, to be able to take seeds with you that you could germinate and get medicines or food or shelter or some sort of um, um, fibers, those kinds of things, all of those are going to be crucial because these are the things that we need here on Earth. So when you look at those things and you think about, you know, the, uh, the difference between packing seeds and packing all the fruits, vegetables... And, you know, the whole idea of fresh things. You know, what's shipped up there is mostly free, frozen, freeze-dried. It's mostly freeze-dried. So to have things that are fresh, if you're living long-term, you don't want to live on freeze-dried stuff forever. You miss that fresh food type of thing, and um, plants would give you that capability. Our research really is more kind of fundamental about how plants respond to gravity, microgravity, how they're going to respond in general. Um, You know, there's not a potentially a direct application. However, just understanding these mechanisms and how all these things work together, you know, what are the genes that are turned on, not turned on, how are they turned on, allows us the capability, potentially, of modifying the expression of those genes in ways that we need to meet human needs. Um, So, you know, I I can't sit here, this is not applied science, Mm -hmm. by any stretch of the imagination. Um, But this is kind of fundamental knowledge. You can't really have applied science without fundamental knowledge. You need the breadth and the depth of knowledge about an organism in order to be able to start looking at how to modify it for human needs.
Yeah, I really want to know how gravity is, how the signaling of gravity works. I mean, you take this biophysical stimulus of a plant falling on its side or getting knocked over or going into space and not having that directional capability, and it is transmitted into a biochemical response. How does that happen? I mean, that mechanism to me is incredibly interesting. And when you look at what I've done with a gypsy response, where we use a cold treatment to isolate the signaling events. So when you think about this, you know, you put a plant on its side in the cold and it doesn't bend. I mean, that's not surprising in and of itself. You need enzymatic activities, so forth, that would be prohibited in the cold. However, the perception actually occurs because when you bring it back out and you put it vertically, it bends. It sort of remembers that signal. Now, to add to that, if that's not cool enough, to add to that, that signal has an expiration time, if you will. So if I take a plant and I put it on its side in the cold and then I put it vertical in the cold, if I leave it long enough, it will forget the signal that it would previously have remembered. So when I bring it back out in the warm, it no longer remembers that signal. That mechanism in and of itself is incredibly interesting to me because we don't have those types of mechanisms. Um, we don't have knowledge of those types of mechanisms. Something that not only gets held, a signaling event that occurs, but then gets stopped. Sort of like a dam. And then when you bring it back out in the warm, the dam breaks down and it flows through. But not only do you hit the dam, but then you can degrade that signal. So a signal that can be degraded as well as move forward. It's an incredibly interesting mechanism. It's a, uh, it's unique, um, and who knows if I'll ever figure it out. <laughs>